Thank you, Luke. I'm going to leave my coat on if you don't mind. Um, it was minus one in Mount Waverley this morning. I think it's a little warmer here now, but I, I still feel uh, in my body very cold in this beautiful warm place, warm place of fellowship. So it's an honour for Pauline and myself to be here today. We feel like we're at home in this place. We feel very much at home at Jubilee and amongst all you folks. Um, I remember saying uh, last year that I felt like 2015 would be the best and the worst of years. And I believe it's kind of shaped up to be like that. There's been some horrible things happen and there's been some great things happen. And it seems like uh, when it's at the darkest, the light shines the brightest. And so I want today for you to take heart that even though uh, there, are, there are very dark times, we've, we've gone through dark times as a world, and there are dark times as a nation, this is the time for the light to shine the brightest. And the best days are ahead of us. This might be the best and the worst of years, but the best days are ahead of us. The best days are ahead for the church. And you might think, you might be tempted to think that how can the best days be ahead? Well, we're on the edge of something so amazing. Uh, I just want you to continue to hope and to have faith and to pray and to expect and to speak it out that the best days are ahead for this nation. And we're going to see in the days ahead, millions of people you know, in this nation come to know Jesus, come into the kingdom, and impact the world. The Lord. Uh, uh, I'd love to hear a hallelujah. <laughs> I'd love you to be in agreement with me. <laughs> so I want you to say these words after me. I'll just get my text up so that I don't make a mistake. Okay, say this after me. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is, upon me, is upon me, for He has anointed me, he has anointed me to, preach to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So as you go out to preach the gospel, the good news, I want to encourage you to use as few words as possible. Understanding this. That you have a history. And it's his story. You have a history. And it's his story. And your history is your testimony. And the scripture says that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So what's the anointing on? Testimony. Your testimony. Your testimony has an anointing on it. And you can simply tell your story because it's His story. There is an anointing on it. You don't have to quote the Bible. Unless He tells you to. Your story has a very powerful anointing upon it. And as you share it, you'll be amazed at what he does. I was reading the book of Acts in the Passion Translation recently. In um, Acts chapter 8. Let me just find it for you. Then I'll get to my point. This is a uh, 
in the book of Acts, and it talk, it's talking about the gospel spreading through Samaria. And it says, although the believers were scattered by persecution, they preached the wonderful news of the word of God wherever they went. Philip travelled to a Samaritan city and preached to them the wonderful news of the anointed one, Jesus. The crowds were eager to receive Philip's message, to receive Philip's message, and were persuaded by the merry, by the many miracles and wonders he performed. Many demon-possessed people were set free and delivered as evil spirits came out of them with loud screams and shrieks. And many who were lame and paralyzed were also healed. Here's the key line. This resulted in uncontrollable joy filling the city. So I'm going to read this again. Although the believers in Australia were scattered, they preached the wonderful news of God wherever they went. And all who knew him travelled across the nation and delivered the news of the Anointed One. And the crowds were eager to receive this message and were persuaded by the many miracles and wonders they saw. Many demon-possessed people across the nation of Australia were set free and delivered. The lame and the paralyzed were healed. Amen. And in every city in the nation, this resulted in uncontrollable joy Amen. filling the city, including Frankston. How about that? How about that? Right. Hey? Praise the Lord. Can you have that? Yes. Yes. It's yes. amazing. I'm just going to get a bit closer so we can chat rather than preach. <laughs> Nearer, my Lord, to thee. He's just getting on now. Getting down to business. I'm warm now. <laughs> I don't know about you, but over these last few weeks at our church, we've had a feast of really good speakers. And it seems like that God's teaching us and reteaching us things that we've known in the past and maybe forgotten. But He wants to reinforce their value and the truth and the power that He wants us to receive. Because we're in these amazing, challenging days. Uh, just as Luke um, talked about same-sex marriage and all the stuff that's going on about that. You know, God is going to be victorious in our nation. The, the ones who are pushing the other stuff are going to be amazed at what God does in the days ahead, as in many other countries. Jesus said in Peter, to Peter in Matthew 16, verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And I believe that over these last few weeks, certainly for us and probably for you too, that he's been reminding us about these important keys for the kingdom. Yeah. So in, in our continuing quest to answer uh, the questions, how then shall we live? And that's really the title of this message today. How then shall we live? And so I want to share some thoughts this morning about our hearts, our minds, and the power of our thoughts and our words. Our hearts, our minds, our thoughts, and our words. Okay. So when I get to heaven, the first person I'm looking for to talk to is they. I want to I wanna meet they. Because they said it's going to rain tomorrow. <laughs> and they said it would be fine tomorrow. And they said storms are on the way. And they said the stock market's about to go up. And then they said the stock market's about to go down. And they said 
the government is in a mess. And they said, the government doesn't know what it's doing. And they said, a recession is on the way. And they said, there's grounds for a recession to begin. And they said, we have too much debt. And then they said, you need to go out and spend more money. And then they said, spend less. And then they said again, spend more. And they said, the church has no power. And they said, the church has too much power. And then they said, God is dead. And they said, religion is the cause of all the wars and misery around the world, they said. And they said that the education standard has dropped away. And, but they said that we're now smarter than we ever were. And then they said, we're dumbing down the education system, they said. The earth is warming up, they say. We're in for a big drought, they say. It's going to be very dry, they say. It's going to be unseasonably wet up north, they say. Massive storms are on the way, they say. There could be a stock market crash any day, they say. We are in the last days, they say. So who are they? Who are they? Did you hear, they say, that there's a big economic correction coming? And they say that ISIS is going to take over the world, they say. They say, the Passion Translation says in Proverbs 18, 21, your words are so weighty, they have the power to bring life or release death. So who said, who are these people that say, who said it? And whoever it is, is it in agreement with what God says and what his word says? Life or death? For when we say, they say, and it's not true, and we're agreeing with it, we're agreeing with a lie, and we have just empowered the lie. <coughs> we have empowered the enemy, and we have given him a legal right. So we need to be careful about they, and what they say, and then what we repeat about they saying this or that, and coming into agreement with it, because coming into agreement with it gives it power and our very words speaking it out give it power. Are we right so far? Yes. Got the point? Yes. So whatever they said, is it from the tree of life, God's kingdom reign and rule, or from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? The spirit of religion. So I want you to think back over this past week, as I have done, in all the things I've said and uttered this week, how many of my words were positive and how many of my words were negative? How many of my expressions were positive and how many of my expressions were negative? Just think about that for a moment. Because the content of our words and our thoughts and the content and the intent of our hearts and our, our words have enormous power for good or for evil. Matthew twelve thirty four says, For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So today I want to focus 
our attention upon words that bring life. These they say words, they say, are mostly from a godless media right. empire. Yeah. They're from a huge empire of godlessness. Mm. They say, and so we say, and what we say is repeating powerful words from a godless, evil media yes. empire. So are we going to agree and then empower the enemy? Can we live in that arena and impact the world for godly purposes by speaking those words? No way. So, how then shall we live? As you know, the tongue can be like a massive firestorm, a whirlwind, a tornado, or a cyclone. Massively destructive. You and I will know this when we think back about the times we said, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. Because yeah. it just took off at a great rate and did a whole lot of damage. But it can be like a soothing ointment on a wound of discouragement, pain and hurt, bringing healing and comfort and wisdom and strength, lifting and building up, strengthening and bringing life. So the tongue can be both positive or negative, healing or hurtful, good or bad. My role and your role as Christian men and women is to see the gold in people and to look for the diamonds in the dirt and look for the treasure in people. Religion on the other hand looks for dirt in the diamonds but we're meant to look for the gold in every person and see the good in them and see them as God sees them to see their potential and to speak that out and words of affirmation and encouragement to lift them up and never put them down. Our world desperately needs people like that to look for the gold. Are you looking for the gold? We need to be aware that <coughs> religious people and the religious spirit doesn't take very kindly to the behaviour of looking for gold. Especially if you, you're calling the gold out in someone that actually has a whole lot of other very obvious faults. The religious spirit doesn't like that. But remember according to uh, Romans 14 verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of rules about food and drink, but it is in the realm of the Holy Spirit, filled with righteousness, peace, and joy. So the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy. What does our world need? Righteousness, peace, and joy. What does Frankston need? Righteousness, peace, and joy. What does our government need? Righteousness, peace. And joy, what does our education system need? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Wow, what should we be speaking out of? The realm of the Holy Spirit, righteousness, peace, and joy. In righteousness, Paul is speaking of putting others first and expressing goodness in having right relationships with others as well as right living. Pauline's dad was a great uh, preacher and teacher and he had a saying that said right believing leads to right living. Right believing leads to right living. So I want to ask the question this morning, what are you believing? What are you and I believing? And how is that 
affecting our thinking. Uh, our beliefs are in our hearts and in our minds and are most often manifested through our thoughts, imagination, our words and our actions. So if I say the word heart this morning, heart, heart, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? Broken, heavy, sad, happy, hard, soft, compassionate, loving, jealous, pure, angry, judgmental, caring, closed, open, hate, critical, religious, sweet, beautiful, fragrance, joy, spiritual, calm, troubled. Because out of the heart, our mouths speak. And we bless and curse, or lift up, or put down, encourage or discourage, bring peace, or cause pain and chaos, according to the condition of our heart. Our words reflect the contents of our heart, and any negative or hurtful words will be in agreement with the enemy, and will give him power to accomplish what he wants to accomplish in ours and the other person's life. Coming into the agreement with the enemy empowers him and gives him a legal right to do what he's looking for. He is the accuser of the brethren. We were, we were at a school musical on Friday night and, and one of the words was, believe the lie and give it power. Believe the lie and give it power. But conversely, positive affirmation, encouragement, love, beauty, fragrance and joy is the language of heaven. The language of the kingdom to accomplish, to lift up, build people up, to encourage and affirm them, to bring them up to a higher level and to demonstrate God's presence and his glory. So if I say the word mind, M-I-N-D, what do you hear in your head? Power, confusion, knowledge, positive thinking, negative thinking, criticism, gossip, lies, impure thoughts, accusation, negative role play, helping others, giving, investing in people's needs, <coughs> anger, spot, <coughs> payback. All of these words feeding into our imagination further potentially inflaming our words. So how then shall we live? Perhaps many of us in this room, or some of us in this room, have a series of, of ungodly beliefs out of which we live. An event may have happened many years ago to cause us to accept a belief that it, we feel like it's entirely true, but in fact, it's totally untrue and it's a lie, but we live out of it. Because right believing leads to right living, yet the converse is also true, that wrong believing leads to wrong living. So as an example, a child, as a child you may have been told by your mother or your father or a school teacher or someone else in authority that you're actually a bit of a dud, that you're pretty useless and you won't amount to anything. You, you're hopeless. You just won't amount to anything. Or someone in authority may have dropped in this little pearl into our minds like, you're not as smart as the rest of them. You're not very bright. You'll never do very well academically. You'll always have a lolly paid job. None of this is true, yet it had, has had a profound effect on your life from then till now because we believe the lie. It took root in our heart 
and we lived out of the lie. And so we've become a victim of an ungodly belief, which is, in fact, a huge lie. But we're driven and influenced by it every day. Like Thoughts like, I'll always be poor. I'll never have any money. I'll never get a job. I'll never get a good job. I'll never get married. I'll never get married again. <laughs> I'll always be lonely. I'll never have close friends. Nobody likes me. I'm useless. I'm hopeless. I'll never amount to anything. I'll never get out of this mess. Everything is impossible for me. I'm always confused. I'm always messed up. Now I want you to know, I've heard lots of people say this, those words, but they have great power. For example, we've, we've, we're one year into our new church. And um, I think Pauline and I would want to say every week, it's going to be a great crowd today. But we have people in our church who say, not many people are going to be there today. And you know what? They won't be. But we talk it up. It's going to be a great crowd today. And there'll be a great crowd. And today, this day, we're going to have a great crowd catch the fire in Melbourne. Great crowd. But there'll be people who'll talk it down. Ah, oh, it's minus one. They went way early this morning. Ah, no, they won't come out today. It's too cold. Rubbish. Our words have power. Great power. Our thoughts and our words have great power. The scripture says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. There's a scripture that says, speaking into being that which is not, as though it were. And, and I use that scripture in, in speaking out, you know, things I want to see happen, uh, prophetic words. Uh, you know, the church is going to grow. Thousands are going to come into the kingdom. We're going to see millions come to know Jesus, speaking into being that which is not as though it were. But we can take it the other way. We can speak negative things into being. And they will be. They will be. So we have to guard our minds. All those things I read are always before. I'll never have money. Not only are they ungodly beliefs, but they are inner vows. When we say, I'll always or I'll never, we have just made a vow. And it's powerful. It takes root. And it makes us who we are. So I want to encourage you today to think about the ungodly beliefs that you have believed that are lies and the vows you have made that are not correct and they're not godly and they're certainly not helpful. And when we get to the ministry time at the end today, let, today let's turn those around and, and release ourselves from those ungodly beliefs and inner vows and walk in freedom, walk in power, walk in His might, walk in His goodness, walk in His spirit. Amen. Thank you, sister. Amen, too. So some people live in this whole area of um, speaking and living neg negatively with uh, alarming consequences. Not only do they affect their own lives, but the lives of those around them. Many people are very negative. And I, I want to say to you today that negativity is the fuel of nothingness, hopelessness and faithlessness and despair. Negativity is born in fear. Yes. Yes. Oh, no, 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 no. This, no, no, that'll never happen. No, no, we're not going there. Did that before and it didn't work. No, oh, no. No, I can't do that. Negativity is the fuel of nothingness, hopelessness, faithlessness, and despair. It is ungodly. I'm not saying you're ungodly, but negativity is ungodly. Don't live there. It will consume your life and the lives of those around you. It comes straight out of hell. It fuels hopelessness and kills hope. It drives out faith and it fuels fear. 
And it acts like a wet blanket over everything. Don't live there. Don't live in that place of negativity. Jesus was never like that. You know, he's the one we're to follow. Jesus was never negative. You know, what if the disciples had come to him and said, um, oh, I've got all these thousands to feed. And, and Jesus said, oh, it's a lot of people, isn't it? <laughs> what are we going to do? Well, look, well, we're all in up looking, let's get out of here. <laughs> or, uh, or someone came to him and said, well, you know, I've got five loaves and two fish. He, he didn't say, well, what? Don't be stupid. What am I going to do with that? <laughs> he was neither faithless or negative. He knew what the Father was doing and thinking. And that's exactly what he did. And that's what we need to do. Father, what do you want to do? How do you feel about this? Oh, okay. We'll do it that way. So the mind of Jesus had no negativity. He only spoke life. Why? Because he only saw. And he only saw what the Father was doing and he only heard what the Father was saying. Life, 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 life. So say after me, life. Life. We want life. Jesus said in John 10, 7 to 11, I speak the eternal truth. I am the gateway for the flock. All those who broke in before me are thieves who came to steal. But the sheep never listened to them. I am the gateway. To enter through me is to experience life, freedom and satisfaction. The thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, kill and destroy. to go where that shepherd chose me to go because in that place there will be abundance more than I can expect life in its fullness until it overflows the truth is that he Jesus is the gateway to life his words are truth and life and his desire is to give us everything in abundance look guys I've heard this message for years you know what makes the difference? When you believe it. I've heard this message for 70 years almost. And it's like, oh yeah, they're speaking out of the Bible. Oh yeah, it's all right. It's true. Frankston will be full of joy when we believe that this is true. Frankston will be full of joy when we believe and live in those truths. And we're living in abundance. We're sharing abundance. We're giving away abundance. And people are excited about the, the abundance they're seeing and receiving. That's the truth. It's what's going to change the nation. People believe this stuff. It's amazing. His words are truth. So why isn't that happening? Well, I'm going to suggest that because some of us may have ungodly beliefs, inner vows, negative words, hearts of stone, ungodly imagination, hearts full of pain, unbelief, no faith, or words like, it will never happen for me. And of course, with those words, it won't. We need to say, yes, it will happen for me. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what are we carrying? Is this all right, guys? Yes. What are we carrying in our hearts today? And what are our mouths speaking? Have we come into agreement with the enemy? 
where we have given him significant power or are our words positive and uh, in affirmation and in line with God's word and his purposes for us. Philippians 4 verse 8 in the NIV says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Brian Simmons in the Passion Translation puts it this way. So keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honourable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts, fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising Him always. So when I keep my thoughts on Him and in Him, I am in agreement with my Heavenly Papa. I am in the light. I am in His presence. I am surrounded and filled by His goodness. There is no darkness at all in His presence. I have, in fact, stepped up into grace. I live in divine favour. Stepping up into grace is an amazing thing. Because in grace, I want to tell you the enemy can't get you up here. Down there at the justice level, the, the enemy is the best lawyer in the world. But up here in grace, he cannot get up here. So I try, Pauline and I try and live in grace all the time. And part of living in grace um, is, is never getting involved in gossip. Always living in forgiveness, forgiving and releasing, stay in grace. So we can live in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That's an amazing arena to live. Because where, where the grace of Jesus is, the Holy Spirit and the Father is there. Where the Father is, the Holy Spirit and Jesus is there. And where the Holy Spirit is, Jesus and the Father are there. What a place to live. And so you can live in a place of favour. Who wants to live in favour? Living in grace is a place of favour. Like mercy is not getting what you, what you deserve. But grace is getting what you don't deserve. That's the grace of Jesus. That's where we want to live. Great place to live. I love it. I love living there. It's a fun place to live. So if I've stepped into the arena of His presence, my thoughts and my words are going to be authentic and real, honourable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind. So I'm going to be able to see, and you're going to be able to see the gold in people. <laughs> Remember that the tongue is a mighty weapon for good or for evil. It can build up or it can tear down. It can be positive or negative. It can bring light or it can bring darkness. It can bring life or it can bring death. It is incredibly powerful. Who does your tongue belong to? Psalm 105.15, I'm getting close to the end now. Psalm 105.15 says, Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. The Passion Translation says it this way, Don't you dare lay a hand on my anointed ones. And don't do anything to hurt my prophets. Now I'm saying this because some years ago there were there was one particular worldwide amazing preacher that I did not like. And I spoke against him. And and the father said to me, John, don't you dare 
touch my anointed ones. Don't, John, don't you dare. I have chosen him. He's my man. I have chosen him for a purpose. You don't have to agree with him, but I've chosen him. And I learned from that never ever to criticize another Christian doing the work of the kingdom, the anointed ones. The Lord spoke to me very powerfully. I want to tell you that there's a very high cost to the anointing. People who carry an anointing have paid a high price for it. And it's like God is jealous of that. And so I encourage you today, whether you like the preacher or not, whether you like the worldwide evangelist or not, whether you like the tele-evangelist or not, do not criticize him or her. Because God has anointed them for a particular task. Like it's all part of having our hearts right. It's just another little aspect of keeping our hearts right. Let's not criticize people like that. You know, um, pastors will often toss and turn at night because their knower knows there's a lot of stuff going on out there. Their knower knows that the words are being said about them. Sometimes they know what the words are. Sometimes they even know who they're coming from. But you know, when people are touching the anointed ones, they, they can know. And it's very painful. I just say that in passing. The scripture says, let your yes be yes. And let your no be no. Now the scripture says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You know, we need to be very clear. Yep, yes or no. Let's not be uh, double-minded and forever changing our mind. The Passion Translation says, but just let your words ring true. A simple yes or a no will suffice. Anything beyond this springs from the deceiver. So in our relationships, let's be real and transparent and pure in our relationships. Let's not pretend. Let's not pretend we like someone when we don't. And it doesn't mean we go up and say, I don't like you. <laughs> Ask the Father why we don't like them. What's the issue? Is it them or me? And he'll probably give you a pretty clear answer. So let's be, let's be real and transparent in our relationship because the people of Frankston will know us by our love. The ecstatic joy in the city when our love is pure and transparent. It'll be amazing. So we need to have words, of act, words and actions of love, affirmation, yes. encouragement. Kindness, care, compassion, purity, sharing, unselfishness, light and life, thoughtfulness, grace, peace, forgiveness, understanding, patience, joy, endurance, and perseverance. Paul said in uh, Philippians 2, 5 to 11, this is the Passion Translation, let this mindset become your motivation. He that is Jesus existed as the expression of God. Yet he gave no thought to seizing that alone as his supreme prize. Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant. He became human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man. He listened to the Father and was obedient to everything he heard. He was a perfect example, even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God exalted him 
and multiplied his greatness. He has now been given the greatest of all names. The authority of the name of Jesus causes every knee to bow in reverence. Everything and everyone will one day submit to his name in the heavenly realm, in the earthly realm, and in the demonic realm. And every tongue will proclaim in every language Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh bringing glory and honour to God his Father. The first sentence says, let this mindset, that is the mindset of Jesus, become our motivation. Let this mindset, the mindset of Jesus, So let this thinking be yours. The mindset is the one we're all to seek. And it means to act like Jesus did. To make Christ-like decisions. To hear his voice. To, hear his, to ask him. Like you can actually ask him. You can actually say, God, what do I do now? And he'll tell us. A lot of people don't know that. You just say, Father, what do I do now? And just, just wait. And he'll tell you. If he doesn't, just keep practicing. Because <laughs> he, he actually wants to talk to us. Yes. He wants to have a relationship with us that's that wonderful. Well, God, what do I do now? Oh, right now. Okay, I'll do it that way. The mind of Jesus. So when Paul boldly states, I have the mind of Christ, he's declaring, I too have made myself of no reputation. Like Jesus, I've taken on the role of a servant. And Paul asserts that the same can hold true for every believer. We have the mind of Christ. The scripture said, let this mind be in you. This mind is pure. This mind has no bitterness. This mind has no malice. This mind knows who to trust and what trust is. This mind has sought healing and has been healed from past hurts and memories. This mind is in line with the Father's will and purpose. So keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real and honourable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind. And fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising Him always. When I keep my mind and my thoughts on Him and in Him, I am then in agreement with Him, my Heavenly Papa. I am in the light. I am in His presence. I am surrounded and filled with and by His goodness. And there is no darkness at all in His presence. I have in fact stepped up into grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So let this mind be in you. Well what kind of a mind do you have? Where is it located? Where would the GPS find your mind? What is in your mind? Are you out of your mind? No, no, that's not. What consumes your mind? What actions does your mind drive? What imaginations do you dwell on? What kind of words, expressions and mindsets are driven by your mind? Or can we say, no? I've let this mind be in me, the mind of Jesus. Let this mind be in you, Paul said. I've let this mind be in me. So when Jesus went to the cross, although he could have, he didn't change his mind. Because you and I, 
were on his mind. You and I were on his mind. So he emptied himself, he listened to the Father, and he died a criminal's death on a cruel cross. So that we can say today, no, I've let this mind be in me. This mind, just like the mind of Jesus. I don't know what this has said to you today. I've got no idea. But I know that I've I know that I've told the truth. And the scripture says, and the truth shall set you free. And we need to live in freedom. And like I said earlier, you know, I've heard messages like this all my life, and a lot of it was like, that is just pie in the sky. How could you ever be like that? But it's absolutely true. The enemy would want to tell you otherwise. That that is totally unachievable. You are too bad. You've gone too far. You're too far down the track. You can never change now. And that's just another lie. Don't believe that one. Because God is the God of the second chance, the third chance, the tenth chance, the hundredth chance, the thousandth chance, and the ten thousandth chance. He will always give us another go. Isn't he amazing? He will always give us another chance to get it right. He'll always give us another chance to come to him and say, God, I got it wrong again. And he goes, come on, son. That's okay. And he gives a big hug. He called us back. Stand with us. And we have a choice to either go with him or, you know, go away again and have to come back for the hundred thousandth chance, if we're like that. And he'll still receive us back. Because that's what he's like. So today, as we conclude, I don't know where you're at. But as we conclude, if you have ungodly mindsets, negative thinking and attitudes, a critical spirit, impure thoughts, looking for dirt in the diamonds rather than diamonds in the dirt, you're consumed with gossip or cynicism, bitterness, unforgiveness, and resentment, remembering that bitterness, unforgiveness, and resentment will rot your bones and make you very sick. Or anything else he tells you to bring. This day is an opportunity <coughs> to have a fresh start. This is a, an opportunity to have a clean slate, a clean board. Wipe the board clean. Start over, start over, start over. Because he is the God of the second, third, fourth, fifth, and whatever chance. He is the God of new beginnings. And he loves new beginnings. He's there right with you at every new beginning. So, Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you that you've told us how we should live. But not only have you told us, you've actually given us the power to live that way. You've given us the power. Your spirit lives within us. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We are indeed privileged, Father, to live in that arena. And it's really only our minds that would tell us we can't and we don't. It's like a choice. I want to live there. I don't believe I can live there. I'm not good enough to live there. And today, Father, we don't want to agree with the enemy. We don't want to empower him one more time. But today we want to say, yes, we're going to step up into that place of grace. We're going to stand by side by side with you and receive everything that you want to place within us today, understanding that out of you comes fullness of joy, fullness of everything. And so, Father, we ask that you will speak into our hearts by the power and the might and the glory and the goodness and the greatness of your Spirit today. Show us what we need to get rid of. Help us to see what we need to embrace, that we might be all and everything 
you want us to be. And Father, that this city of Frankston will be full of joy because of the people they see so proclaiming and declaring who you are, so full of your goodness and able to give it away. Because we know that the more we give you away, the more we receive. It's like multiplication, multiplication, multiplication. So Father, Holy Spirit, come now. Just speak into our hearts. Show us and tell us what you want us to do today in response to your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So as we conclude today, as, you, as we conclude today, you know, if you want to do business with God today, you want to say, God, I, you know, I, I have messed up. I do want to have it. I do want a changed mind. He will give you the power to have a changed mind. Because that's what he's like. And so uh, if you'd like to put the music on, Jack, that uh, be good. And, oh, yeah. Look, if you'd like to play the music. If you would like to come for ministry today, uh, we would love to pray for you and with you. Yeah, thanks. Hey. Yep, we'll uh, invite our prayer team if you want to just come and uh, assist Pastor John. Okay, but if you would like some prayer this morning, I encourage you to come. Susie Boo's birthday, she's brought us in some birthday cakes, so we've got birthday cake and cups of tea and coffee. And, uh, if you want to just linger, just want to receive some ministry, just come. Have a great night. There is power. Jesus.